Hello, Aspies, and welcome to another edition of Inside the Asperger Studios. I'm joined with Dr. Kundo, who is an emotional specialist who specializes in dealing with your emotions. And today we're going to be talking about emotions and depression and how they go hand in hand with each other. Thank you for coming on the show, Dr. Kundo. Thank you so much. It's an honor and I feel extremely grateful to be here on this show today. Thank you. You're very welcome. Why don't you give us a little background on yourself and then we'll get started. Yeah, sure. See, um, I wear different hats and different times. So I have been, uh, you know, in my own search for answers to questions and for healing and comfort. There is a point in my life that I realized that I have ended up with, uh, you know, being a practitioner in 20 different therapeutic and healing modalities and coaching modalities. So sometimes I take on the role of a mentor. Sometimes I'm a coach. I'm a therapist. At the end of the day, what matters to me is to take my clients from where they are to where they want to be. It does not okay. matter which modality I'm using. So I'm a doctorate. I did my doctorate and my um, PhD in the effects of meditation on human mind and happiness. My master's was in Jnana Yoga. Actually, from my father's side, I come from a spiritual background. Uh, my great grandfather was Swami of Vedananda, who was, you know, the president of the Vedanta Society in New York. Uh, you know, in, during the 1920s. So it kind of runs in my blood in that way. So since my childhood, I was very naturally, you know, drawn towards meditation. And it was a way of life. And, uh, you know, life has its own twists and turns, ups and downs. You plan something and then you realize that a bigger plan is in action. So through all the, you know, sometimes through rewards and sometimes through pains, you know, I went through almost, uh, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of um, different phases of life and each phase was equally important in teaching me something. And, uh, you know, uh, starting from uh, coming, you know, born into a dysfunctional family where you, you know, we all have an idea how our parents should be. And in reality, it is very different from what, you know, who they really are. So when I was like four years old, my father left, uh, you know, left us because he wanted to take up the spiritual path and he wanted to become a sannyasi, which is like a monk. So as soon as he left, um, you know, uh, obviously my childhood turned into an adulthood or rather a parenthood. Nobody told me that I have to take care of my mom, but back of my mind, I already knew that I'm the only one she had. Mm. And there started already a dysfunctional concept of what love is at the age of four. So coming, you know, forward in time, going forward in time, I uh, went through huge financial loss. I came from a business family, you know, on, from my uh, mother's side. And uh, we had outwardly everything from wealth, grandeur, anything you ask for, you know, you name it, we have it. That's how it was like. But, um, you know, again, the family went through its own stories. There was the financial crash of 2008. We saw my own business was hit as well. So there was a huge economic loss. And at, at the same time, I lost also my fiance with whom I was together for 12 years in a car wow. accident. So, um, you know, 12 years is a long time. You think your life is all planned out. You got it all sorted. And that's when life hits at you unexpectedly, when you are most unprepared. And uh, I went completely emotionally numb at that, uh, at that time because we didn't even have our, you know, the death was immediate. We didn't have our even the last chance to say goodbye to each other. And as soon as that was over, it was like as if life was not done with me. My mom was diagnosed with a degenerative lung disease. And I had to, you know, at that point, you know, you, you don't want your parents to feel unsupported 
at that time. And it was practically like watching the countdown of a death clock going on. So as I was handling my business in Europe, in Dubai, in Mumbai, in Hong Kong, I had to fly back to India to take care of my mom single-handedly. And that is when you find out who your real friends and family are. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, once that was, you know, um, it, it, you know, a lot of times you feel like, you know, you do not have a choice in life, but you are sucked into that moment. I did not have a choice in my fiance's death. I did not have a choice uh, in my mom's disease, but I was sucked into all of it. And when my mom passed away, um, if you have lost somebody close to you, you realize no amount of spiritual knowledge or uh, prior uh, reading of books, gathering information about death can actually prepare you for that moment. The moment is so painful and cathartic. And uh, there I was sitting in my apartment and I realized I actually do not have a family. It hit me that stark reality because I didn't have siblings, I didn't have father and uh, the rest of the family, you know, relatives were too far away because I did not fit in in their box, you know. So once, uh, you know, as I was going through all of that, I made the biggest mistake in my life because, you know, they say the life of a Zen monk is of one of continuous mistakes. I got <laughs> married <laughs> because not because I was in love, but because I was looking for emotional dependence. I was looking for somebody from outside to give me that security and safety, that acceptance and love, which I was looking for throughout my life. And uh, I just wanted to live that fairy tale uh, of, of every girl, you know, have, uh, living that life. And as soon as I got married, it turned into a very abusive marriage. And the reality, if you have been on that, you know, receiving end of abuse, or you know someone who has gone through it, you realize that um, it, the hardest part is to accept the truth to your own self. Because you feel that tomorrow morning when I wake up, things are gonna change. Either this person is gonna change or worse, I'll change to fit myself in. It's a weird kind of security blanket that the life, you know, your mind takes on. Though you know the pattern is self-sabotaging, you still hang on to that pattern because you know what's coming next. It takes so much of courage to actually make a leap outside that known pattern. So making the long story short, physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, everything, that made me go through that time, I could not even recognize myself in the mirror. And when that final betrayal happened, you know, that was the time I took the craziest decision of my life. I just packed my bags and I was like, this is it. And uh, I went up to the Himalayas. <laughs> I spent two years over there. I met my guru over there. And, um, you know, um, it, it, was a, it was a journey, you know, it, it was a process. It didn't happen overnight. But you realize at some point that the real work is within. I had to throw away all those glossy new age books. I went back to the basics again. You know, I went yeah. to you know, read through scriptures, ancient scriptures. You know, I studied the Vedas. I studied Kabbalah, you know, I meditated and meditated and meditated because the first thing I remember I asked my guru that everybody is living for somebody. You are either living for your children or for your parents or for your spouse. Who do I live for? I don't have a purpose to wake up tomorrow morning. And he asked me one question and he asked me, what do, what do uh, you know, humans live for? I'm like, I don't know. And he said, you know, we all live for our own self. I can show you the road, but the journey to know yourself is a journey alone. And that's when I started getting comfortable in that silence of the mountains, you know? And I remember one of his, uh, you know, uh, it's beautiful words. He said, you know, your inner circle it's like a garden. 
you don't want to bring in weeds in your garden you want to fill your garden with the most beautiful full you know most colorful of the flowers so choose your every thought choose your every emotion choose that every person whom you want to allow to enter that personal sacred beautiful garden of yours what an incredible story it's almost kind of similar to what happened with me i mean we lost my father in 2017 suddenly from lung cancer my mother never had a chance to say goodbye right and it, it, we never got disclosure and so yeah we were just left hanging there with what now and then and i realized i needed to pick up my pace because my brother has got his own life with his family and I'm living with my mother. So now I need, I've become the one to look after my mother, even though she says, I don't, I need to look after myself, but I still look after her because I feel it's kind of my responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. How old were you at that time? Um, I am 49 now, uh, 46. Right. 17, we lost him. I mean, it started with, I went away for school in Europe in 2014. And they moved south to the south side of Chicago, closer to my brother. Lo and behold, they never told me until they sent out an email saying that we're moving. And then I come home, my dad winds up with back problems and then back problems lead to him getting a pacemaker. And then he, we were fine. And then one day he started with wheezing and they thought he had pneumonia and then they took care of that. And then he still had, it. and then he goes in and it turns out that he, he, part of his lung had collapsed. And at that point they said that was because he had a tumor growing. Right. And so at that yes. point we, and then at that point we tried everything. My mom got him to go to her oncologist and he was going to go on experimental medicine and by the third visit he was the doctor said he didn't look good and rushed him over to the hospital and by the time he they got him into the room he was in like a comatose state he went to sleep and just never woke up right right so about 10 the next morning my parent my mother and my brother come home and that's when i i myself couldn't register the fact that my mom was walking with a box of kleenex in her hand and then at that point they told me that my father had passed so, so yeah. you never got those last words those conversa conscious conversation no him. i never got the last thing i remember saying to my father was I love you. And that was it. And my dad used to say every time he'd leave for his um, oncology appointment was, I'd say, I love you, dad. And I'm, he's like, Reed, yeah. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. And then third visit, that was it. Yeah. And I must tell you, Reed, your father heard you. That we know my mom has got a friend who is a medium and she yeah. said, do you want me to try to talk to him? And she, my mother said, yes. Yeah. And she came back to my mother and she's like, she relate all this stuff that only we knew, like the initials of her, his brother and his brother-in-law and his sister that was surrounding him. He yeah. was the woman named Helen was with him. That was my grandmother. Um, he was surrounded by poppies. That's the area in the fun in the cemetery that he was buried was the poppy section. Yeah. So all these things. And she said that he knows that my mom talks to him at night. He's with me when I'm working on my blog or my podcast. He tries to leave us subtle little messages here and there, but he's yeah. always looking over us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as you can tell, I'm a very, my mother and I are very spiritual people. I mean, we, yeah. my mom's an astrologer. 
I I mean I believe in all that stuff. I mean I believe in yeah. the paranormal and the afterlife. I mean Yeah. I'm a good son. I look after my mother and Yeah. Yes, you are. You're a very good soul. And you know what, Reed, because uh, I've done a lot of past life regression cases and there are a couple of cases I did where the person had been in coma. And when they went uh, into that, you know, past life is, I don't necessarily mean 500 years ago. It, it's even five minutes back is your past life, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, when they went through the session, they could tell precisely while they were in the coma, what were the conversations going on in the room? What were the feelings of their relatives, their parents, you know, uh, and the friends who were present in the room? So even though when we see that a person is in coma, we are energy beings, end of the day. Yes. I mean, my mom told me that the minute he passed, the room got colder. I'm like, well, that's my father's yeah. spirit. He's leaving, yeah. the, he's leaving his body and he's going. Yeah. But we just found out, yeah, my mom just told me yesterday, the last yeah. of my father's family had passed away. So he's surrounded now by his entire family. Yeah. Except for yeah. like the sons and cousins of my, like my mom says, the other generations. But his immediate family, all his cousins, his mm. sister, his brother in law, his brother, his, his sister's second husband, who he was close with his two co cousins that he was really close with so his entire family is now up there yeah and yeah we are like the last of my father's um family my mom my me and my brother we are the last miles in the family yeah yeah you know i always say that um there is birth and death but life always continues yeah Every uh, night when I sit down for my uh, meditation, I'm always preparing for that last moment. My mom always, my mom always used to tell me too that I used to always look into the future, and she's like, "You can't do that. You have to live each day for its, each day as it goes by, because you never know when you're, if you're going to wake up for the next." And I never realized that more than when I was at school because yeah. I was so stressed out that I just couldn't have fun until I came across a story that basically said, in a nutshell, you got to learn to put your stress aside and live your, yeah. and live your life. Otherwise, you're going to be incapacitated the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we can live in that awareness of our, you know, mortality, it adds so much more value and meaning to our life. Yeah. But uh, the funniest part is when you look around, everybody lives as if they're going to live forever. Yeah. Everybody knows this is, this is the, the truth of life, but nobody wants to talk about it. It's a, it's a negative thing. Let's not talk about that. I mean, if you think about it, we, technically we are living on borrowed time we only have this life to live and my mom it found this poem and there's a woman she even wrote a book it's called i don't know if you've ever heard of it but it's called the dash and it's basically it's not about the day you were born or the day you died but it's about that time in between and that's mm. that that's the important time is that little dash when you live yeah. not about living or dying it's about how you live that life yeah yeah absolutely because that moment i think you know uh it comes in all of our lives that moment will come one day when your own conscience will ask you so what have you done throughout your life then you can't say oh i made so much of money in my bank account lying there or you know i have worked so much I mean, but what value have you actually, because now in today's time of volatile, volatility, it's not about just, you know, living a life of success. It's living a life of value. That's what that's, matters the most. That's true. I mean, you can be the richest person in the world and your time has come, but 
the minute your time has come, I mean, that question is asked, what have you contributed to the rest of the world? Yes. And what have you yes. done for yourself? And, yes. and when it comes time to say St. Peter's at the gate, he's just going to look at you and just say, what have you done for humanity besides rack up a bunch of money yes. and become a millionaire? And that person's going to say nothing. And he's going to say, I'm sorry, but you're not going to be allowed past these gates. You have not contributed to humanity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, that's the reason why I started my blog and the podcast and my YouTube is I wanted those out there who are struggling with autism, I wanted them to know they're not alone. There yeah. are so many YouTube channels that that are going over all the little, little topics and everything, but no one's addressed that one thing is each and every one of us thinks we're alone in this fight, but they're not. There are so many of us out there with, uh, with ASD that have either conquered some of the issues, who have done things that others haven't. I mean, my biggest thing is stepping outside that comfort zone, taking a yeah. risk in your life. Yeah. If you're an introvert, it's time to change that introvert to an extrovert. Take off your your blinders and see the world. And that's what my mother told me when I was at school after I graduated. She's like, don't come home, travel. You never know when you're going to go back. And look what happened. Corona hit and travel has been cut. Yeah. And basically I'm all about, you're not alone in this fight. And I want those, I want people to know that. Now is more of a time, uh, you know, to create that strong community, to build that strong community where we all pull up each other. None of us are living in an island. No, I mean, that's very important. Now is the time to reach out to friends and family. Yeah. Because everybody now is isolated because of yeah. what's going on. You can't go out. You can't do this. You can't do that. You're limited to what you can do and people get homesick and they can't see family so reach out to your family talk yeah. to them let them know you're there teach your grandparents how to use zoom talk to your parents if you're living on your own but make it in it make it an initiative to do it so your family knows they're not alone out there either yeah and the first thing comes actually with the self-acceptance yeah I mean, I have a friend who's like me, but more severe in, in the ASD and with ADHD. And he's got, and this is why I want to get into the talk about depression and emotions is he's in the very an emotional person and he's got severe depression with his ASD and his ADHD. And he's constantly looking back and constantly looking at his life and saying he's useless. And I'm always the one who's always putting out the fire. And I keep telling him, you're not useless. You can't look back. You got to look forward. And you just can't dwell on the fact about your depression. You need to move on with your life. But it just doesn't stop with him sometimes. He, he, just, re he, he just thinks about his failures and never can move forward. Because see behind every trigger there is a wound in the past mm -hmm. in his wound, so what I mean, is happening with your friend it is very clear that he's in an autopilot mode mm -hmm. it is something in his unconscious mind that has been constantly disrupting his conscious behavior and thinking and you know his emotions so this is the, and most of us are not even aware of it. Where is it coming from? That's when we feel helpless. It's not that your friend doesn't want to shift his way of thoughts, you know, his way of thinking and his life process. Everybody deserves a chance at happiness and everybody wants to avoid pain. It's, we all go through that. But there is definitely something from his unconscious mind that is constantly working in the process to disrupt that flow. I'll give you a simple example. 
uh, you know, because we say zero to seven years, whatever we go through, that, you know, makes up 80% of adult life thoughts. It's pretty powerful. And um, I had uh, one of uh, my clients, I remember, uh, a beautiful, intelligent lady, and uh, she went through a very abusive first marriage. And uh, once she came out of that marriage, then she was doing, you know, my workshops. She used to come regularly to my workshops. And uh, then she was in a relationship with this wonderful gentleman. Um, he was financially stable. He was very educated. He was a very nice person to even talk to. So I told her, well, congratulations. You have a wonderful partner this time. And you know what? Uh, she answered back. She said, yeah, but it's so boring. So what yeah. happened over here is basically when we went through the session, while mm. she was in the womb, in her mother's womb, wow. even before she was born, her mom was going through a lot of stress and anxiety during so that, those months of pregnancy. So that, and whenever that, that mm. happens, Mm -hmm. The cortisol level goes up high. Oh. And that cortisol is flowing through your amniotic fluid. And as a fetus, you're absorbing it. So these kind of uh, children, when after they are born and they are grown up as adults, their cortisol set point is already very high. Anything mm -hmm. peaceful is boring for them. Huh. They're always looking for hypertension and challenges and restlessness. And all this happens even before you are born. So could that lead to somebody having ADHD? Yes, absolutely. It can wow. go back even in the time when you were a fetus in the womb. So you can almost say ADHD is almost hereditary because it comes from the parent into you into the womb and you don't even know it until you have it exactly wow exactly you are absorbing the emotions of your mother wow that is something right there so the, it can go very deep so which is why we need to go to the source of it you know what i say uh, i have written a book on emotional mastery right and uh, i have given a seven step emotions breakthrough formula. And I call it like, let's say you have got a migraine. Mm -hmm. You have got a terrible headache and it's disrupting your day's flow. You cannot even work because there is a throbbing pain going on. So what do you do at that time? You take a painkiller. The painkiller immediately, you know, takes off the symptoms. But at the same time, that uh, you know, the painkiller is not enough. It's not taking, going to the source of it. That migraine might be happening because you have got some sort of deficiency inside your system. So then you know, you need to go back to the source of it. And this is what I'm talking about. You need to go back to the source of it and find out where this is all coming from the manufacturing unit and stop it from there. It's the same thing in computer wise when you're battling a virus you can eliminate the virus but that doesn't stop where it's coming from you need to trace it back to the root exactly so it's the same exactly thing. and that needs courage yeah it's not for faint heart people no, no. <laughs> <laughs> anyways are there emotions that are linked to depression depression itself is an emotion but uh, where does it come from? Who are more prone to depression? Yeah. See, again, um, there, there is a lot of science behind it. We are all made up of different elements in our body. You have to find out who you are. You know, we are made up of earth, water, fire, wood, air, all these different elements that make up the entire universe. They are also inside your own body. Okay, depression normally hits people who are more of an air element. Hmm. 
okay there is an imbalance in the air element of the body and those are the people who suffer more from disconnection and disconnection leads you to depression Yeah. Okay, different elements will have different, uh, you know, emotions. A person who's more of a water element will have more of fear. A person who has more of wood element will have more of the emotion of anger. But the one who has uh, imbalance in the air element will be more prone towards dip- depression. Now, who are now? How how do you know who's air, if? what you what element you are is there a way to tell that <laughs> yeah i i mean i can i can give you um um very i mean there is a extensive you know test that we do to find out exactly which element all of us are born with one primary element but there is also a secondary element so one to two elements but one of them is the main predominant element for you but if you see if you walk into a room where all these element people they're talking to each other a water element will be saying like um, you know um, in in the same conversation a water element will be like you know let's let's talk this over um, while we are having lunch a fire element will be like that's great what you have said let get you know let's make everybody do it <laughs> a wood element will say are we talking about doing it i have already done it <laughs> a earth element will say you know what let's all come together and form a team and then do it because earth is always a nurturer you know they have the mother heart yeah and the air element will be like let let's not talk about just doing it let's be it <laughs> the air element people are the ones who are the most spiritual seekers you find in the mountains they have deeper questions of you know towards life now who are what kind of people are prone to depression through their emotions um, are people who are more emotional prone to depression like those who are very wanna... break down and cry at just anything or who get depressed easily one of the main reason that leads to depression is boxing up your emotions we all want to avoid pain right yeah. so a lot of times we think by ignoring the pain we are avoiding the pain but instead by ignoring it we are intensifying the pain what you resist persists so basically so what happens either of the two thing will happen either there will be an outburst which mm-hmm. will be in the form of anger or rage or there will be a complete withdrawal that will lead to depression in future over time so it is that not being able to have a healthy expression of your emotions that makes sense so the emotions are going to find a way to express itself so if you are not expressing it outside it is going to express itself through depression yeah i mean one of the best things somebody ever told me was i had a friend when i vol- who was my supervisor when i volunteered at the adler planetarium she too was on the spectrum and i came, came to her and my head supervisor went right after my father passed this was when we had the solar eclipse that i was volunteering for the whole we had a whole special thing going on and i said listen guys um my father just passed away um i need to be here to keep myself busy and they both were like listen any time you need to cry or you need you feel like you're about to cry just do it leave what you what you're doing behind don't worry about it someone will come and get it and take and put it back but my friend said to me listen 
don't hold your don't hold your emotions in what your heart wants is what your heart wants and that sticks to me to this day is and i always tell this to people your heart your heart is always going to predict your emotions yes don't hold your emotions in because you're just going to be a bottled up mess yes because read one thing i say I'm, i'm sorry i interrupted you no no it's okay go ahead no, one thing, because what what comes to me is that, you know, in today's society, we live in a conditioned society. And I find it more with men when they are being taught since their childhood that be a man, boys don't cry. Mm-hmm. Our current education system do not teach us the basic foundational life skill which is that how to express your emotions and how to deal with your emotions when life doesn't go the way you expect it to be. And that can happen many times in life. Like we, you and I both know, we can guarantee that. Yeah. I mean, there have been times where in the middle of the day, just one little thing will like just set me off into a, a big bundle of tears. And it's, just I realized it's just my emotions just surfacing I mean before I started seeing a life coach of my own my mom is my mother has been on me to talk to somebody she's because she's like if you don't talk to somebody sooner or later you're just gonna be get worse and worse and you're just gonna make yourself sick and that's when I and you need yes we need to reach out you know, and a lot of times um, when you reach, especially in, you know, the, uh, you, uh, the part of the world that I am from, if you are taking professional help, people actually look at you in a very strange way that something is wrong with you. You are going to a therapist, you're going to a psychiatrist, something is wrong yeah. with you. Yeah, I mean, my friend's father comes from, you know, he's from the old country and stuff. And he doesn't believe in therapy and he doesn't believe in all this stuff. I mean, I've been trying to get my friend to get into meditation because I, I, I'm a big believer in meditation because I believe meditation, like you say, is very helpful in the fact that it can help you clear your head and you can literally distinguish your thoughts from your feelings as they come and go once you get into that space. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, I, and he's like, he doesn't believe in it. And I'm like, you have, it's not just sitting there breathing and closing your eyes. You literally literally have to do it for every single day to, for it to work. You know why uh, it's great. You brought up this point of meditation. Depression is also Mm -hmm. so much linked to our inner, you know, inner distortion. Most of us are like a washing machine, you know, from outside, it's so calm, but Mm -hmm. inside there is a huge tumble and rumble going on. Mm -hmm. And from outside, we are orderly, but inside when we go and, you know, watch our own thoughts and our own emotions as an observer, that's when we find out, you know, what we think, what we want, what we feel, they're all in different directions. And that creates a conflict, that creates a distortion. And that is, you know, when that is carried on over a period of time, intensifying, piling up one after another, what will it lead to? Can meditation help with depression? See, this is a very interesting question because going deeper into this topic, when a person is in depressed state, Mm -hmm. they have a lack of grounding. So they need to work upon that first before they actually enter into altered state. Okay, because in Sanskrit, uh, you know, when we when we uh, follow the Patanjali yoga system, right? Mm -hmm. Meditation comes in the like much higher in the sixth, seventh level. There are many more levels before it. 
today a lot of people talk about meditation i have heard different kinds of definitions of meditation my prayer is my meditation uh my work is my meditation relaxation yeah. is meditation visualization is meditation even somebody told me i meditate while i drive i was shocked <laughs> like please do not do that <laughs> meditation is not an action we have to first understand what is meditation meditation is a state to be in and there are different techniques there are different paths to follow which can take us to that state that meditative state to be in it's not a verb it's not an action and you know everybody talks about buddha's anapanasati watching the breath yeah but that happened in the last stage before he reached enlightenment nobody sees his seven years of struggle before it when he worked on his emotions and his mind so everybody it's like saying i want to study medicine but i don't want to learn abc <laughs> everybody wants to jump on the you know topmost branch so there are preparatory stages before that we have to be patient in the process we have to take go step by step the first step is that we don't even have relation with our mind we want our mind to think in one way the mind goes in a different direction if i do not know you and i come up to you in the street and i said hey can you just lend me 100 bucks you'll be like hello do i even know you <laughs> but when i have a relationship with you and then i come to you and i say hey reed um uh, will you please give me like 100 bucks and you will be like sure navana of course so we have to develop a relationship a friendship with our emotions our mm. mind and then we sit for meditation there are so many people who are saying i meditate i've been meditating for 8 years i'm like really because it's not about when you are with your eyes closed what color of light you are seeing or uh, you are floating in an angel's wings that's mm. not what meditation is about the miracle doesn't happen when you you are there with your eyes closed the miracle shows in your daily life when you yeah, are I mean, truly meditating in the true sense you don't know half of the people like what they are doing with their eyes closed the moment you close the <laughs> eyes that washing machine inner rumble and tumble <laughs> starts yeah i mean i when i started meditating i mean i started it like right after my i lost my father and it was because i couldn't sleep my mind was just a big jumble like that washing machine i needed that peace of mind i needed to get there so i just started working on it and working on it until the point where i was able to heal. hear my thought coming into my head and realizing i'm being distracted and then i was able to say wait a minute i'm being distracted by a thought i need to get back to yeah. counting my breath and yeah. then at that point i'm realize i'm much more relaxed and when i come out of that meditative state i realize the rest of my day i'm much more calmer i'm grounded i'm not as aggravated So meditation yeah. does help. Meditation does help definitely, but at the same time, go to the manufacturing unit. <laughs> That is also required. You know, each one has its own space in the healing process. One part, you know, helps you five percent. Another part helps you twenty-five percent. But they are all important in the process. No. That's true. I mean, you need to get in touch with the source or like you said the manufacturing unit to find yeah. out what is causing that turmoil inside yourself. Yeah. And once Because you, are... you know uh I I remember one experience when I was in the Himalayas I was there for 2 years and um there was um this yogi I met and um basically his story was Mm, he had been there for in the mountains for like seven years of his life. He had dedicated just in meditation and doing sadhana, and he left his home because he believed that uh, his wife was not faithful to him. 
and uh, he left his, in you know in that fit of uh, reaction and anger he just left home and he also left not just his wife but his seven year old son mm. so in the mountains while he was meditating and meditating for hours he was having a lot of uh, metaphysical experiences he was gaining a lot of knowledge everything was going well for him but at the end of the day when he would be going to bed he would have thoughts of his son and it wow. would bother him and mm. he would feel that guilt within him that i left my small boy at home is he okay who's taking care of him did i make a mistake what about my responsibilities and until his guru told him that go back and tend to your responsibilities to your duties a true yogi even while living in the societies knows how to stay detached but not disconnected and move slowly and steadily towards the goal well wow, that's a very good story so that You're... is what i'm saying also you have to take care of the source cause the root cause yeah. yeah i mean if you don't take care of that root it's gonna manifest somewhere yeah either yeah. in your emotions or in your thoughts and it'll sit there until you finally handle it absolutely i mean like with me i mean my root source was my loneliness i guess from my father because we were close and then once i realized that how close i was i never realized how close i was to my father until i lost him and my it took my mother to tell me that your father was like your best friend and by losing him it's bringing out all this emotion in you and there's, i mean you pretty sure can, i bet you you can tell in me i'm a very emotional person a lot of things set me off i mean we watch vet shows and when you hear about someone putting their pet down i break down you are a mix between earth and water you are that nurturer type mhm mm you are that you you have that big heart i do you take care you like to take care of everyone yes In but that. also there is a flexibility adaptability about you the flow of water the flow of the river yeah i mean that's why my mom's always telling me you need to take care of myself because she can take care of herself but it's it's hard to do when I am always want to take care of her, you know, cuz she's my mother. It's I just feel it's my responsibility. Yeah. Now, how do we go on? Yes. Go on. No, uh what I'm saying is a lot of times also we have to be very aware there is a thin line between parentification and doing mm -hmm. your duties. because your role to your mother mm -hmm. is that you are her son she takes care of you you take care of the next generation yes in a certain way right but you right. do not become her parent no but anyways um how is there a way somebody can get in touch with their emotions beyond meditation like to know what emotions are gonna arise at any given time absolutely it's it's very simple process it's just um would you like to try it sure okay and you are a meditator already so this yeah. will be easy for you so you just close your eyes and take a deep breath inhale through your nose and exhale releasing all tension one more time inhale through your nose and exhale 
releasing all tension. Now scan your body from your toes going up your feet, your lower legs, knees, thighs, gently into your hips, bringing your attention to your abdomen, your lower back, mid back, upper back, your chest, your shoulders, your arms, your hands, fingers, your neck and throat, your face, your eyes, your forehead, top of your head. Wonderful. One more time. This time, bring attention. If there is any particular part of your body where you feel a discomfort or a tightness, Is there any particular part of your body where you feel a discomfort? Mm -hmm. My lower back. Right. Just focus on the area of your lower back. Is that region heavy or light? Heavy. Between one to 10, how heavy is it? 10 being the heaviest. About a five, I'd have, I think. Five, right. Does that have a warm feeling or cold feeling? Warm. Warm, right. Wonderful. Now, as you focus in that area, you know that there is a particular emotion that is creating that heaviness. Command that emotion to come forward. It will come in the form of a shape. a shape, a form, appearance, a color. Do you see this emotion? Mm -hmm. What form is it? I have to say a red triangle. A red triangle? Mm -hmm. How big is the triangle? Not too big. About medium size. A medium size red triangle. How are the edges? Are they very sharp? Are they kind of soft? Sharp. They look more like sharp edges. Sharp edges, right. As you observe this red triangle 
in front of you? Is it static or is it moving? Static. It's static. Excellent. Just to observe it and watch it. How is this color red? Is it dark red, deep red, light red? What kind of red is it? Kind of light red, almost orangish red. Orangish red. Is it very clear, transparent, or is it like murky, dull, bright? Dull. It's dull, orangish red. Now, as you observe it, you know exactly what this red triangle, which emotion it is. The word will come either telepathically for you or in written form in front of you. Which emotion is this? That's a tough one. Almost sadness, but I'm not sure why. Sadness. That's okay. That's fine. Now, as you communicate with this red triangle of sadness in front of you, develop a relation with this sadness. This sadness has come into your life to give you a certain message. It holds the value. Look at it through the lens as if it is a gift to you to tell you where in life you are at. What do you need to do? Ask this sadness, since when it has been with you, an age, a year, trust the impression. I think it's been with me since I've lost my father. Right, right. Wonderful. So now you know yeah. your lower back where the issue is coming from. So that discomfort in the back is just my emotions of sadness, of it's grief, sadness, loss. Grief, loss. Uh, yeah. Will it ever go away or will it just... Of like... course it will. Of course it will. There is no delete button in our memory. No. But the emotional charge of it. You know, sometimes we think so many things have happened in our past. Some memories we remember and it immediately evokes a reaction, an emotional response within us. We want to cry thinking about it. We still get angry thinking about it. And some of those memories we think about it and we just laugh about it. We are like, okay, whatever happened, happened. Because the emotions do not have the shackles in those memories. No. Now, would you say that getting in touch with your emotions is very important to like a day-to-day -day life? Absolutely. Awareness of emotions. It's extremely important. We should take breaks at intervals throughout the day to check on our emotions. And to find out, as we did just now, you know, the easiest way is through your body. There are two ways to go about it, mind to body or body to mind. For most people, it is easier to go from body to mind mm -hmm. because that's the most tangible source of information for us. So once you scan through the body, you already know which part of the body is feeling tight. Something is going on there. And you just connect to that part. And the more you practice, the easier it becomes. It doesn't take more than three minutes. 
mm-hmm. and you find out which emotion and you have to be just honest with yourself and trust the impression that is coming up for you and ask the emotion why is it there and ask the emotion what do you want me to do it's nothing but a messenger the emotion is not you you are separate from your emotions the moment we say it the emotions do not have a hold over us the moment i say i am not depression depression is just a transient impermanent emotion that is passing by throughout the day how many emotions are passing by in a matter of few minutes how many emotions are passing by so what is not permanent there is no value of my attaching myself to that emotion right to that mm-hmm. impermanent object in life so the moment we come to that thought process that i am not my emotion i am separate from my emotion immediately that emotion loses the hold over you and that's when you make that friendship with that emotion you acknowledge it you say thank you for coming to my life because i totally understand you are here to give me a valuable information acknowledge the emotion connect to the emotion i mean rather i say it's not right for me to say connect to the emotions because as long we have our five senses we will always be having our experiences through those five senses and always be having a connection to those emotions of those experiences but be aware of that connection third give gratitude to that emotion it softens the ground mm-hmm. and then have the conversation and once you are done the last step is to shift that emotion so now you found out since when it has been there with you when you go deeper because you are already a meditator you know how to do it mm-hmm. so really? talk to your emotion further have a deep conversation and ask the emotion only what do you want me to do what course of action do you want me to uh, you know take in my life do you want me to change my perspective towards a certain situation or do you want me to change my action towards a, the situation perhaps all you need is a more deeper spiritual understanding about the process of life and death to understand that he's not in the physical form but he's there in the energy form or perhaps you have already reached that level of deep understanding all you need to do is change your action towards it connect to your father in an energetic way and come to a sort of closure either perspective or the action mm-hmm. now would you say that emotions come from the subconscious emotions are coming through our five senses mm. so emotions are always going to be there i remember once i asked my guru <laughs> when i was in a beginner stage and i said i'm trying to take anger out of my body and mind and he was very surprised <laughs> at my statement and he laughed <laughs> and he said how can you take your anger out of your system because since you were born till the day you die you will have your five senses and you will be gathering your experiences through the five senses and through which emotions will always going to be there you have to make your anger sit peacefully <laughs> you have to be able to have that capacity to command your emotions that you are not a slave of your emotions you are a master of your emotions i've heard that sometimes i've heard i've heard that somewhere before like you are the master of your emotions yes no i mean that kind of reminds me how do we convey our emotions when we ourselves don't understand them sorry could you repeat the question again How do we convey our emotions to somebody when we don't understand what emotions we're feeling? Because there are yes. those of us who are on the spectrum. People say that we're empathetic, but the truth is 
we just don't understand our own emotions. Yes. That is why inner work begins before the outer work. Expressing to someone is outside. Right? But the trigger is come from within. That's so true. you have to fix within to fix outside. We are in current, uh, you know, time, we are doing exactly the opposite. Whenever we are feeling angry, we are feeling depressed, we are feeling lonely or frustrated. What are we actually doing? We are trying to change something outside. Change the job, change the environment, change him, change her. But what we need to do is to go within and do the change within. It's the same so thing. It's I again coming back to the same point, Reed. Like, don't try to jump on the topmost branch without going through the lower branches first. You're just going to fall flat on the floor. Yeah. And that's going to hurt. Yeah. It's the same thing I've told my friend about happiness. I mean, he's like, when am I going to be happy? I'm like, well, the thing is, first of all, you got to find happiness within before you can find happiness yeah. on the out. And yeah. once you find that happiness on the inside, even though it's buried beneath all that depression, I said, listen, you are on so much medication for your medic for your anti he's taking antipsychotics, he's taking medicine for depression. I'm like, it's it's you I'm like, your talents are there. You just need to dig deep beneath yourself, find that yeah. happiness, find yeah. what made you happy before all this, and just keep at it. And then the more you keep at it, the more you're going to find that happiness. And yeah. you're going you're gonna to be glad you did. Yes. You know, it's like that um, we know that a deer who has that um, mask in its own womb, mm -hmm. but it's running everywhere to find that mask outside. It's the same like that. <laughs> It is already there within, but we are searching outside. People need to realize that the emo your emotions don't control you. You control your emotions. Absolutely. And this is a myth when people say that I cannot control my emotion. Uh, you know, um, emotions cannot be controlled. It's a myth. Yeah. Totally. Because uh, see, end of the day, we have free will and that's what makes you know makes us different from the other animals we have to learn to utilize our free will make that conscious choice happiness is there as much as worry is there but it is our human mind that always tends to go towards the negative than the positive. A simple, a simple story I'll tell you, like, um, you know, this woman is telling her mother-in-law, mother-in-law, I love you so much. And then mother-in-law answers like, really? And she said, of course not. And she says, of course, I knew that. <laughs> Our mind grasps at the negativity first but the positivity is right there at the same time it's which voice we choose to listen to it's practice again in the beginning you know um in in meditation also you must have found this that when you first started your meditation there were a thousand thoughts coming that uh, you know in the way the moment you close your eyes but as time went by, you know, those thoughts came down from 100% to 70%, then it will come down to even 40%, it becomes less and less and less. You create that space more and more with practice. That's so true. Like we can't go to a gym and next day morning I look at the mirror, hey, I haven't developed any muscles so our gym doesn't work. I'm not going to go back there anymore. Nope. Consistency is required. Yeah, that's true. Discipline and is required. It's the same thing. There is no, the, you know, two-minute noodle. We are worth more than two-minute noodle. Yeah, it's the same thing with meditation. You just can't do it once and say, nope, it doesn't work for me. Meditation, exactly. Meditation, anything that takes time, takes yeah. patience, and takes, 
and takes drive. I mean, you need to have that drive to say, hey, listen, one just one time isn't going to work. I'm going to commit to doing this. Yes. Constantly. You need to have patience. Because everybody, you know, nowadays, most people, everything they need instant right now. Somebody comes to me and tell me, um, you know, um, can I be, uh, you know, out of my depression in one hour of session? I'm like, it took you probably seven years, eight years to come to this point. And in one hour, you want it all to be overgone. I don't have a magic wand. That's what a lot of people say. I mean, there is no such thing as a magic wand or a magic session or time to get rid of it. I mean, depression... You can't get rid of it, but you can work with it and deal with it to the point that it's not affecting your life. Yes. I, 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 some of my shows, I'm pretty sure you heard, I've talked to a couple of people and they've, and they've said they have depression and they found ways to work with it. I mean, one of the interviews I talked with, he said he has depression I'm like, how do you deal with it? He's like, I found things that I enjoy doing and that helps keep me busy and helps keep my depression at bay. And that's right. one of the things I believe in is if you have depression, no, no matter how severe it is, you have to have to put in effort to want to work to get rid of it. Not get rid of it, but work with it to the point that it's, held at bay and it's not affecting your life right i mean a point comes when you say finally enough is enough that's when you are ready to break mm -hmm. out of it i mean and it's also your emotions i mean your emotions play a big part in your depression if you're sad and you're constantly regretting your life that sadness is going to manifest into depression and you got to learn to take that sadness and just put it away. You have and to know what is creating that sadness. And you have to do something about it. We say reliving the moment is relieving the moment. I mean, with my friend, I mean, he's told me, I mean, the two things that led him to this is he's lost his job due to a meltdown and he's lost his scholarship due to a meltdown and he keeps looking back at that and calling himself a failure and i'm like you know what you did wrong now you need to figure out what to do that's right to help you move on i completely agree with you and another thing what comes up from uh, this case is also how he has been conditioned to believe that failing is totally relatable to his job and mm. uh, you know losing scholarship I mean the hardest part for him is his father like I said is old school and he keeps calling him a failure and yeah I'm like, then you need to talk to your dad. He's like, well, it's not going to work. I'm like, my dad doesn't believe in therapy. I'm like, well, then you, and then the other part is his, he's gay and his parents are so ag against it that they totally ignore the fact that he's gay and won't even call his boyfriend a boyfriend. They'll call him a friend. And that drives at him to the point where Instead of bringing his boyfriend over for his birthday, he goes there to his boyfriend's house. And I mean, all that together, I think, is just sitting and festering in him and it's just bringing him down. See, in this case, there is not much you can do about the other person, right? Because mm -hmm. obviously his parents are born into a different generation. Yes. They are carrying their own baggages, their own experience, their own belief system, their own, you know, uh, conditionings. Mm -hmm. So at this age, it is hard for them to change. So in such cases, there are only three things that you can do. Either change yourself, 
change your own conditioning, own belief that you have to understand that if you are going to wait for everybody else to accept who you are, then it's never going to happen. There is always somebody who's going to be unhappy with you in life. I mean, that's a, that's a given. I mean, someone once told me you can't make everybody happy with you. There is going to always be. You will wait one... all your life then yeah. for everybody but... else to match up to your standards, to your beliefs, to your expectations. I mean, my mom. So you that... have to, the work is to change your own conditionings and your own belief systems the way you see the world. I can wear a rose colored glass and I can say everything is pink, but is the world really pink? No, it's not. Yeah. I'm wearing pink glasses. That's why I'm seeing it <laughs> pink. You want to see the world green, change your glasses. So either you change your own self or you change the situation, which means you just walk out of the situation. You walk out of that environment. You surround yourself with an environment that is more supportive to your growth and empowerment. Or number three, if you cannot do the first two, then make peace with the situation. You have to accept it. Yeah. I mean, my mother's always said, you don't want to bring yourself down to someone else's level. No matter who Absolutely. they are, no matter who they are or what affiliation you want to be, you want to take the higher ground. See, I mean, his parents have already lived their life. They are not going to be living his life. He has to his, yeah. his, live his own life. I mean, I told him part of the problem is they probably want a grandchild and they know they're not going to have it unless you adopt. That okay. is their definition of success and happiness and fulfillment in life. But you have to define your definition of success and happiness and fulfillment in your life. When I've told them and it's do, not necessary that it has to match everybody else's yeah. expectations. Yeah, what I've told him to do, and it sort of helped him, is I've had him write affirmations down once a day. Something like something positive to kind of reinforce it. Because otherwise he tends the seat down. And then I have to then rebuild him back up because then he'll like he came at me yesterday thinking he his life is over. He's nothing. He's a failure. I'm like, no, you're not. You got to look at where you are now as opposed to where you were then. Absolutely. He has to work more on self-nurturance, self-acceptance and self-love. Mm -hmm. That's something, I mean, self-love is something that every child should be taught since mm -hmm. they are born. To love yourself. Yeah. Yes. But as soon as a child is born, and they realize that only if I'm going to get good grades in the school, my parents are going to love me. Yeah, I mean, that's not right. I mean, your parents, parents have to love you no matter what. It has to be an unconditional love. Yes, not you are taught being, a, you know, being a people pleaser since the early days of your childhood. We are, that is going on in an autopilot mode, this obsession of nicehood. Mm-hmm that I have to be nice to everybody. <laughs> yeah. I mean, emotions, I mean, people just don't realize that, that emotions play a big part in who you are in life. I mean, your emotions don't control you, but they do kind of play a role in how your life, how you live your life. And let me tell you one very interesting fact. Every emotion has a lifespan of only six seconds that I didn't know. Yes. When we were talking about that, you know, um, that uh, can we actually create our own emotions? After six seconds, if the emotion is continuing, that means that we are refueling it. So if we think about it again, we're bringing it back up. Yes. So that's okay. where the willpower comes in. That's true. I mean, we are human for maybe five minutes even. We will be, you know, in that state when we are angry. Something happens, it triggers us, we get angry or we get into a depression. For some people, it's five minutes. For some people, it will be five hours. Yeah. People yeah. But a then a moment comes when you become aware. I am depressed. I am feeling angry. 
And that's where immediately you have to jump into action. And say, I'm not going to let it take over my life. I'm going to yes. let that, I'm going to let that emotion come and go. Yes. And then you have to, how will you be able to jump into that action? You need to know why do yeah. I want to make this shift? Some people are driven by pleasure. Some people are driven by pain. You know, if I'm going to change my, uh, you know, I don't want to be in depression, but why don't I want to be in depression? You need a proper answer to that. Because if I'm in depression, what are the bad things that are going to happen? It's going to affect my family. It's going to affect my wife or my husband or my children. It's going to affect my work. I might, what if it affects your work? Then my boss will be angry with me. What will happen if my boss will be angry with me? I'm going to lose my job. What if I lose my job? I won't be able to pay my rent. I will not be able to pay my bills. Is it the pain that is going to drive you to take you out of the depression? Or is it going to be the reward that if I'm not going to be depressed, what will happen next? Oh, I'm going to feel so elated and joyful. What happens when I feel elated and joyful? Oh, I'm going to be, you know, putting my 100% in my project. What happens when I do that? I'll be getting a promotion. What happens when I get a promotion? I'll be getting a raise. What will I do with the raise? I'll be going for a five-star holiday with my family. <laughs> so you need to have a good why behind your motive. And that's why self-awareness is so important is because you're aware of that emotion. And then you got to dive down and figure out why you're feeling that emotion. And once you're doing that, you got to find that positive side to say, okay, what's the, po what's the, what's the polar opposite of that? That will make me happy. Yes. You have to see one size doesn't fit all. Some people will be more driven. You, you, you see when like, you know, um, sometimes uh, there are two children in the street hmm, mm -hmm. and um, to one child, the parent gives a chocolate and says that, you know, if you do your homework, you will get the chocolate. And because of the chocolate, the kid will do the homework. The other one, the mother slaps the child and says, if you don't do the homework, you will get a slap. And because of the fear of the slap, the child is going to do the homework. So you have to see a chocolate works for you in life or a slap works for you in, the, in life. It's true. Everyone is different. I mean, everyone is driven by something to drive them to do something. Exactly. What will drive you? You have to find out and you have to be honest about it. So yes, Find out why this emotion is here and work on that. Reframe that situation. Get to a deep spiritual understanding of it. That's working in the manufacturing unit. And the other part of it is work on the why. Why do I even want to change this emotion? Are you sure that you want to change this emotion? Sure. Because some people, mind you, they want to be in that state, perhaps because it is giving them more attention. Hmm. I didn't and they are in that. the need of acceptance and love. And they feel that is their way of getting the attention of their family or the people around them. That I didn't think about that. Uh, they might want to be in that, that emotion because it's giving them attention. Yes. That's I had clients, uh, you know, who went through that, you know, they were uh, taken in bed completely. They couldn't walk, you know, there was, there was this particular client, I remember. And when we went deep into it, in the first, uh, you know, instance, when I asked her that, um, uh, do you really want to, you know, get up and walk normally? And he said, she said, of course, I want to, of course, I want to walk. <laughs> Why would I want to be, you know, stuck in my bed? I'm like, okay, let's go deep into it. And when we went deeper into the session, we found out actually she feels when she's stuck in the bed, she gets more attention and love from her children and her husband. 
they're wow. always tending to her needs that are you okay is your medic have you taken your medication what else can i do for you that's her way of getting love and attention so that was buried deep down in her subconscious yeah. is that because yes. whenever she gets sick in bed she gets more attention and it just kept manifesting and manifesting and then yeah. just showed itself as hey i'm just going to cripple you and keep, and so you can't get out of bed until she realized it's just her subconscious saying hey i'm taking control of your life absolutely well i mean people don't realize your subconscious plays a huge part in your life absolutely it's uh, it's you know 97% almost of your brain the subconscious mind yeah i mean i mean your subconscious and your emotions are the two biggest things that control your life you just have to learn to take control take control right back from it and say hey listen i'm not going to and- let you take control it's my yes. life and which is why you see a lot of times this uh, theory of law of attraction doesn't work for many people law of attraction exists but there are also different other laws that are working together so if we are continuously saying that you know i'm rich i'm rich i'm rich but deep down there is a voice which is telling you are you crazy look at your bank account <laughs> i mean you can look It's at not the gonna work you can look at the richest person in the world and underneath they're depressed yeah you know i had one client i remember um from india and he came to me his issue was he always used to earn 100000 indian rupees and after which something would happen and the money would just go away some sort of emergency situation would happen or some sort of need will come in and the money will not stay in his account anymore he couldn't cross that limit of 100000 so when we went through the session we found that when he was a little child one day his father came home overjoyed because um he got a huge deal of 100000 rupees and his mom was also overjoyed and they were celebrating because in those days 100000 was a lot of money so in his child's mind it got fixed that 100000 is a lot of money that's the ultimate aim to hit <laughs> now as he grew up times have changed and in today's time 100000 rupees is nothing but his mind is still working in an autopilot unconscious mode that 100000 is the ideal goal to hit and after which he will be attracting some sort of situation and the money will not stay with him speaking of autopilot is there a way to get out of the autopilot yes absolutely when you go deep in the session of when you are doing a inner child session for example and you come face to face with your unconscious mind and i love doing this work because i always tell all my clients when you enter the unconscious it's like entering a cave and you know you don't know what's going to be there what you are going to find there because even while um before they go into a session many times consciously they say that this is the issue i want to solve but your unconscious is already deciding no there is a bigger issue a low hanging fruit which needs to be dealt with first and that will be coming up first i mean people yeah people don't realize it there are so many things in your mind in your subconscious that you can see one problem but your subconscious sees three others that need yes. to be de- dealt with that yes. you're just not seeing i mean you can look at the happiest people on earth i mean i remember there was a story in the news about a girl who was happy on the outside and then she was miserable on the inside wound up killing herself until her parents didn't realize this until they found her journals in every one pa- every page she just wrote it was just sadness after sadness after sadness you even look at the happiest people on the planet like robin williams i mean you look at him from yeah. the outside 
he was this happy-go-lucky guy, but you didn't realize he was fighting depression on the inside and he wound up killing himself. See, that goes back to that uh, washing machine. <laughs> so many of us are so orderly from outside. You look at social media nowadays. Everybody has, you know, the picture-perfect posts. Yeah. How great life is. But you know. there is so much of conflict and distortion that happens when there is, you know, there is a com there is no alignment between what we think, what we want, and who we are, and you know, everything is haywire or in different directions. Yeah, I mean, but we have to start somewhere. Yeah, I mean, it's always important to start with yourself and figure out and make yourself happy before you work on others. And for that, we need to have that trust and faith. It's like, you know, when you start driving a car, you don't see until that last, you know, that the entire journey till the destination, you see it only a few meters ahead, but yeah. you have that trust, the faith that I'm going to be moving forward. I'm guided. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, it all makes sense. I mean, you can only see as far as your eyes can see. And yeah. then beyond that, it's, you don't know what's there. Absolutely. We are always planning. We always want to be, you know, in control because it gives us a sort of safety, a feeling of safety. It's one of the basic human needs, security and safety. So that's why we are going to, you know, tarot readers, clairvoyants, astrologers. We want to know what's going to happen in the future because it gives us a sense of control and a sense of protection and safety. But in spite of that, no matter how much we plan, there is always a bigger plan in action. The universe is always, it always has a... Um... It's always got a second thing. I mean, my mother's always been a firm believer of plan B. When my, my mom always said, my father, to my father, she always said that she'll be the one that will go first because of all her issues and everything. And look what happens. You, the universe decided to take my father. And she always, in, in the eulogy, she had mentioned she was always a believer in plan B. Well, this is plan B. And people need to have that. There always needs to be a plan B in action. We have to understand that the universe put us here. The universe sure. is going to support us. The basic thing in life, our breath, even that is not in our control. So there is definitely a higher intelligence that is working. Anyway, once we understand that, it softens our ground. Yeah, I mean, once we, yeah, I don't think a lot of people realize that there are other aspects in life working either for us or against us, and people just go on with their lives, and, and something happens, and people don't realize that maybe that something was put there by the universe to either leave you a message saying, hey, you need to change your path. It's sort of like um, Scrooge. I mean, as, when he was visited by the three ghosts, they were put there for a reason to tell him, hey, you need to change your ways. Everything is happening for a reason. We can only see so much. You know, sometimes we, a relationship does not work out. We lose a job. Uh, we lose money in the stock market. And we think, oh my God, what is happening to me is so negative. And then five years down the line, we look back and we say, thank God it happened or I wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can even look at this pandemic as the universe saying, hey, this world is filled with so much hate that people need to change their ways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There is always a message behind everything. It's the meaning we give to that experience. I mean... Uh, there are two people, you know, um, looking at the same dog and one is, you know, full of fear. Oh my God, what if the dog bites me? And another one looks at the dog and says, oh, the dog is so cute. I want to take the dog home. Both are looking at the same dog. 
it's like two but people. It's the look, meaning they're giving to the experience. Yeah, it's like two people looking at the same painting, and both neither both of them don't have the same vision of it. One person go, "Oh, what a beautiful painting." The other one can say, "This painting is ugly." Everyone, Absolutely. everyone's got a different view in life. No one. So this is exactly what you do with your emotions as well. What meaning you are giving to your emotions? So no emotion is what is emotion? The definition of emotion, it's energy in motion. No emotion is positive or negative. It is an energy in motion that we express either positively or negatively. That I didn't know. Didn't so know. when depression is coming, depression is not positive or negative. It's just a messenger for you. a blessing a gift from the universe which is telling you your life has gone off track the quality of your emotions will tell you the quality of your life so if your quality of emotion is that of anger fear frustration loneliness depression then definitely they are telling you you have gone off track in life you need to converse with them talk to them find out when did it go off track why did it go off track what can i do to bring my life back on track simple as that once that is done its job is done it will be going and some other emotion will be taking its place the learning never stops the mind keeps absorbing yeah i mean you're constantly learning as you grow and you're learning how to handle your emotions as you're growing yeah so get excited when an emotion happens for you i even personify my emotions if i'm angry okay let's say i'm angry for 2 minutes 3 minutes and then the realization hit me okay i got mr anger visiting me I given give a shape and form to this Mr. Anger. <laughs> It's a red colored man with spiky hair, and I'm like, okay, please sit down and tell me what this is all about. Let's talk. That's an unusual way of putting it, but it but it works. I'm pretty sure it works for you, right? You want to make your life, you know. uh whether you uh make um what do you, uh, uh like you know a tragedy of a situation or a comedy of a situation it's up to you 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 make i mean yeah you're right because you are in charge of your life so you need to decide how you want your life to be yeah if you let your emotions take over your life is going to be a tragedy but if absolutely you, you will be totally out of control but if you you will have no idea what is happening and before you know time will be gone life will be gone but if you grab the reins and say hey listen i'm not going to let you take over then your life becomes a comedy or a, a comedy and you are in control of it you tell that the emotions belong to me i don't belong to the emotion the cloud belong to the sky the sky doesn't doesn't belong to the cloud whether the clouds are there or not the sky will always be there one cloud will pass the next one will come it will pass too so you are that expansive sky and your emotions are like those passing clouds and what's the point getting attached to something that's not even permanent that's going to be there only for some time yeah it's not I worth mean, it no it's go not. for long term go for permanent i mean my mother is my mom's always said why are you so grumpy why are you attached why are you so angry and i've come to realize why am i angry what's going on i should just let that anger come and go let my emotions just come and go i mean they're not permanent they're not permanent parts of my life they're there but they're not permanent they stay they don't they go but they don't stay absolutely but anyways it was great fun talking with you 
And thank, thank you. you. Likewise. Welcome. It was. I hope to keep in touch with you. And um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have a safe flight back to Dubai. Thank you. You're welcome. And do um, you come to Dubai anytime? Uh, I have not been to Dubai. I have a other. Uh, I had another guest who's from Dubai, so maybe sometime in the future, I'll fly out and okay. visit the both of you. Great, great! You are most welcome to come to Dubai. <laughs> you will love it here. Uh, yeah, it should be. It's pretty what sunny all the time there. Yes, absolutely. It's a different experience. All right. Well, thank you, and um, let's keep in touch with each other. Dr. Absolutely, Kudo. great, great. Thank you, Reed. You take You're care. Welcome. You too. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. And guys, remember to click, click that like and subscribe button down below, and click the bell button. And remember, you guys are never alone in the universe. See you then.